This is The Red Line, where we interview three big geopolitical experts on one big issue shaping news both here and overseas. And I'm your host, Michael Hilliard. A few years ago, I was wasting time in an airport in Istanbul, waiting on a flight that had already been delayed. Around me are whole gates with the people simply sitting around and killing time before we could all continue on our journeys. Sat next to me in those uncomfortable red airport seats was a tall, portly Kyrgyz gentleman named Ali, himself on his way home after working a few months in Turkey. With both of us looking to pass the time, we got to chatting, and he asked where I was from. I joked with him that I lived on the far edge of the world, all the way in Australia. He gave a quick smile and explained that he'd never travelled that far from his home in Kyrgyzstan. What he had seen in the world straight from Moscow to Istanbul to Tehran to Bishkek. That was his world. Even myself not having seen every corner of the globe gained a new perspective on where the edges of my known world are. And just like that, my world got smaller. Still not in any hurry, the conversation continued on, and we began to speculate on where other people's edges of the world might be. We speculated that for a Soviet citizen, their world would stretch from the flat heartlands of East Germany to the Palmyra Mountains bordering China. For an Indian citizen, it would extend from the southern jungle tip of Kerala to the snow-capped Himalayas in the north. And for a Chinese citizen, their world would run from the entrance of the Yellow River across the plains and deserts to the other side of the Palmyra Mountains. With every map we pulled up to help us speculate, though, one country continuously appeared, right on the edge of these known worlds. Tajikistan, the mountainous, unforgiving frontier of a country, a combination of deserts and snow-capped peaks with a government that in many ways has sealed it off from the rest of the world. And even though it sits in the centre of the Eurasian landmass, it always seems to be somehow on the edge of every map that we looked at. It's the western edge of a map of China, the northern edge of a US map of Afghanistan, the southern edge of a map of Central Asia, and the northeastern edge of an Iranian historical map. Tajikistan is the very definition of the old, unknown borderlands. So what did Tajikistan hold on to? Why did every civilization in the region sprawl outwards from their capitals, but seem to stop in the foothills of the Tajik homeland? Well, to answer those questions, we turn to our first guest. Part 1. The Edge of Nowhere Well, Tajikistan has the misfortune of being in a very difficult neighborhood right there above Afghanistan, with which it shares a very long border, and it has had its own relatively recent history of conflict, it had a very bitter and bloody civil war in the 1990s. Um, and the legacy of that has been um, extreme poverty um, and extreme kind of hardship for uh, that population. That notwithstanding, it is a much safer country than Afghanistan. It's a much more stable uh, country than Afghanistan. That's partly itself the result of uh, a very different type of governance it's had there. Peter Leonard is the Central Asia editor for the amazing news organization Eurasianet. Peter is one of the most respected journalists around when it comes to Central Asia and has reported for many years all over the Soviet bloc. We are very happy to have him back on the program today. Tajikistan is a very rural country and despite the Soviet modernization project, it remained a very rural country pretty much until the end of the whole Soviet experiment. Uh, uh, around two-thirds of the population lived in the countryside even in, in 1991 when the Soviet Union collapsed. Um, industry uh, was pretty underdeveloped, not entirely um, accidentally perhaps. Uh, there are four, uh, five uh, republics in Central Asia and the Soviet Union. And the way that the Soviet Union organized the um, industry and uh, the production of electricity and agricultural production in Central Asia was that they were all sort of co-dependent on one another. The cynical reading would be that it was done to sort of create kind of a, a, a sort of a weakness, kind of an interdependency. A more benevolent interpretation is that this was simply the most logical way to arrange the countries. As a result, in this sort of setup, um, Tajikistan uh, is the host of a very large hydroelectric uh, 
uh, plant uh, which was built uh, back in the Soviet days, which fed electricity to other parts of the Soviet Union. Um, and then there were other kind of areas of, of uh, the economy on which it was very heavily dependent. So we're thinking uh, cotton um, and then cultivation of uh, certain other kind of, uh, uh, edible um, uh, foodstuffs. Um, but what you get out of that is a quite a sort of um, a monolithic kind of economy that sort of hinges on on a very few um, important areas of production and assets. There is always this worry today of terrorism leaching out of Tajikistan into the wider Central Asian region. Was this also a concern during the Soviet era? No, not really. Uh, the I'd say the Islamic reawakening um, probably happened fairly late into the Soviet period. Obviously, the Soviet authorities were deeply hostile to religion across the board, not just uh, Islam. So um, religion was very underdeveloped for a long time, and but never really entirely stamped out. So, yes, Tajikistan preserved its Islamic identity, but very much sort of below the surface. That begins to change towards the end of the Soviet period as the Soviet Union begins to open up as part of its whole glasnost um, uh, initiative. Um, and so you can talk about change in the 80s, but really the role of religion only becomes pronounced, I would say, in the post-independence period in the 1990s. Tajikistan used to export huge amounts of rugs, apricots, cotton, and uranium, and they were also the major supplier of aluminium for the entire Soviet Union. From what I understand, though, a lot of these industries have taken a major dive since the collapse of the Soviet Union. So what happened? Well, the aluminium plant is still very important um, in the kind of economic makeup of the country in that it's really the only major uh, domestically owned industrial asset that Tajikistan has. Aside from that, uh, there's a lot of mining uh, that goes on, so a lot of gold and silver mining, uh, but that's uh, kind of a, a, its whole issue in that a lot of those mines are increasingly being taken over by Chinese mining companies, and it's debatable as to uh, how much benefit they bring to the economy in the aggregate. Um, a lot of gold is produced, and, and Tajikistan has relatively good gold reserves, but uh, you know, in terms of job production and uh, value added from that mining industry uh, for the domestic economy, um, the role is probably relatively small. And then finally, yes, agriculture is important, um, but in the overall picture, it represents a far smaller um, sort of slice of the economy than it probably could or should. In very broad terms, we look at a map of the country, it kind of looks like a very crude drawing of a side view rabbit standing up on all fours, with big ears that jut up into the air. And if we stick with our rabbit analogy, the capital Dushumbe would be based right about where the rabbit's heart would be. The country can be roughly divided into about three zones, the ears and the head of the rabbit being the northern zone, which contains the majority of the population and the capital Dushumbe. The ears of the rabbit being the corridor between the Tajik heartland around Dushumbe into the tumultuous Fagana Valley, shared between Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and Kyrgyzstan. The front legs of the rabbit will be the southern zones, bordering Afghanistan, where a lot of the problems are today. And the back half of the rabbit would be the hard-to-reach, isolated Bandakan National Park, bordering China and populated by the Palmyras. So, can you take us through each of these different zones and how they interact with each other? Yes, well, Tajikistan is a small country with a relatively small population, but you wouldn't know that from actually traveling around the country because to get um, from one point to another, it seems like it's a very short distance on the map. But sometimes uh, it can take drives of up to 18 hours on these absolutely terrible roads. And what that gives you is this quite sort of segmented, regionally segmented country. Um, and uh, as you say, um, you can sort of, very broadly uh, divided up into this uh, northern section, which is divided from uh, the center of Tajikistan, which is where the capital city is. And uh, those two areas are divided by one range of mountains. And then off to the east, the very sparsely populated Pamias, um, again, are their own thing. 
in as much as uh, the people who live there, the population is very sparse indeed, the people who live there uh, belong to, uh, in fact, another ethnic group, another, um, they belong to, in fact, they are uh, members of a uh, Shia, uh, let's say, um, sort of sect, that's how it's described, typically Ismailis, whereas most uh, Tajiks are Sunni Muslims. Um, so th that, just to put it in geographical terms, essentially sort of sets out why these kind of regional um, sort of formations, why traditionally uh, Tajikistan is quite kind of a, a regional country. The Palmyra areas, or the back half of the rabbit, are incredibly sparsely populated, with only a single major road connecting the two halves of the country. Was this a symptom of Soviet centralization in their planning, or simply just a result of the country being so mountainous and difficult to traverse when making up highways? It is extremely hard to get out there. It's very high. Uh, nothing much grows there. Um, uh, there's one uh, relatively mid-sized city called Horog, uh, but then the second largest urban settlement, if you can even call it that, Murgab, even a little bit further to the east, uh, not far from China, is so high that you can't even grow anything more than very basic crops. So uh, these are not um, areas that are um, forgiving for um, uh, sort of people to live in. So I, the, primarily the reason that, that there, there are not more kind of larger, larger centers is because of that. At the same time, um, the Pamirs uh, did back the losing side in the Civil War of the 1990s. Um, and that, I think, has not helped their cause uh, overall. As I was saying earlier, um, the, the roads that lead to the Pamirs um, are absolutely abysmal. And so you really need a kind of a experienced driver and a 4x4 four four to even get to this part of the country, which territorially accounts for half of the country. I mean, it's not nothing. Um, and I think that this neglect, in my view, is probably not accidental. I, I think uh, there is, um, there are reasons to suspect that the government simply sees it as a low priority. One, because it is indeed quite sparse. Uh, but secondly, because historically, this is not considered a very uh, loyal population. The situation in the East is not the only major consequence of the Tajik civil war. Many of the remnants and leftovers from that war still affect the country to this day. So can you briefly take us through the Tajik civil war? So the roots of the war, I think you can probably identify in the pre-Soviet um, collapse. Um, what you start to get there, as I was alluding to earlier, is um, the emergence of new kind of social currents, there are more kind of nationalist sentiments being expressed. And you see this across all of the Soviet Union. People start to kind of assert their national identity in much more um, obvious ways. And this was always anathema in the Soviet Union, because although the Soviet Union created these kind of top-down, created these, these um, you know, national units like Uzbeks and Tajiks and Kyrgyz and so on, um, at the same time, they sort of strongly discouraged nationalism as such. But you see that sort of starting to um, emerge in the uh, late 1980s. And so in the kind of chaos of the uh, uh, Soviet collapse, these things really come to fall. Um, but then in Tajikistan, this is all compounded by uh, a couple of other strands. Um, the collapse of the economy is particularly intense. And the, when the economy collapses, what you get, of course, is you know, the resources uh, shrink and uh, you know, the elites who are kind of jostling for, for power anyway in this uh, post-independence chaos um, you know, are suddenly finding themselves fighting for a, a far smaller kind of share of the spoils. Um, add to that Islam, as get, again, which is, which is kind of an, an emerging sort of pole around which um, uh, Tajiks are certain Tajiks are beginning to identify. And then finally, add on to that layer, yes, the, the, the regional aspect is, is, also, um, is also an element. It isn't that necessarily different regions uh, hate each other and therefore they go to war. It doesn't quite work like that. I would say it's the other way around in that when conflict begins, people tend to align along these kind of 
regional uh, fronts. So what, what, what the actual um, beginning of conflict per se um, begins in Dushanbe. Um, and this is often how civil wars, you know, they, end, they start in these very sort of um, um, depressingly kind of uh, paltry ways. There are protests in the center of Dushanbe. These different camps come out and they're kind of asserting their claims to, you know, how Tajikistan should be, I mean, to put it in the, in the crudest possible way. Um, and so they're literally 100 meters from each other. And, you know, these protests kind of go on for a certain amount of time. But then with time, any protest kind of attracts to it, um, uh, you know, unsalubrious, violent elements. And with time, these two sort of uh, street kind of um, uh, uh, manifestations, you know, start to kind of go into conflict with one another. And out of that, you know, through a whole series of, of vicissitudes and events, um, you know, this much broader conflict emerges. And uh, this carries on for a number of years and uh, you know, brings in, uh, among other things, um, you know, external parties. There are neighboring countries like Uzbekistan, which is obviously extremely alarmed by what's happening and it's, it's also um, sort of contributing its own, uh, covertly contributing its own, its own kind of role into this uh, conflict. So what you, what you get uh, at the end of this war in which uh, ultimately the prevailing side are the sort of the the, the successors of the, the communist rule of the communist elite um, is uh, on one side uh, a coalition of uh, the kind of the northern clans who were typically the kind of where the the main Soviet cadres were drawn from in, uh, in, in this kind of uneasy alliance with the southern clans um, uh, south of the capital Dushanbe, which is kind of where the more kind of um, criminalized, kind of tough fighting force uh, came from. And they came out on top. The war wasn't a clean victory for the winning side that eventually prevailed, this uh, coalition between the, the old northern communist elite and their uh, southern allies. Um, the reason that the conflict was ultimately brought to an end was that um, uh, there was considerable external pressure from uh, security brokers like uh, Russia, mainly, uh, but also, to a lesser extent, Iran, the United States, international organization. And, and, and this culminated in a general peace accord in 1997, um, the, the headline of which essentially was that uh, 30% of government posts had to be uh, set aside for representatives of the opposition. And so the idea of the peace accord was that um, uh, since there would be some degree of limited power sharing, um, this you know, created incentives for all sides to, uh, to, to refrain from uh, further conflict. And so that's, uh, that's the sort of the line in the sand in, in uh, Tajik history. Uh, is 1997 and that peace accord, although things did uh, d degenerate uh, shortly thereafter, albeit not into war, but into waves of repression. So at the end of the civil war, the country goes through about four to five leaders in the space of just over a year, until eventually in 1994, Emmali Rachmanov becomes president of Tajikistan. So how did he become leader over the rest of the pack? Rahman was a former collective farm boss, um, had no particularly distinguished career. He's um, from the uh, one of the southern uh, clans who I was referring to earlier, and uh, was picked on as uh, the president, I think, probably because he seemed like a, sort of a good, uh, at the time, weak, inoffensive, and uh, probably relatively malleable figure. This sort of story repeats itself in a lot of these kind of uh, um, authoritarian states that these people get picked because um, they seem to please all sides in that. He uh, you know, doesn't seem to have his own obvious um, uh, autonomous kind of base of support and therefore um, can... Uh, uh, you know, please uh, pretty much all parties. Uh, 
Um, however, in the immediate uh, post-war um, phase, uh, he's acts very fast to consolidate his authority. So the first thing that he does after a number of years is to uh, begin sidelining all of these um, opposition figures who were allowed as part of the peace accord to uh, enter into government. And he does this steadily and quite systematically. Although, really, we start to see this trend being most pronounced by the end of the 2000s, let's say. And it's around that time when you see this uh, strategy of sidelining the opposition begin to escalate with arrests, killings of the opposition. Um, and that brings you all the way through to 2015, at which point his authority is pretty much kind of cemented and all the former opposition have been either arrested or sidelined or sent into exile or killed. Emomali Rachmanov, who in 2007 changes his name to the more Tajik and less Russian Rachman, took over the reins of the country in 1992 and became president of the first Tajik Republic in 1994. He has now been in that position for over 26 years. Six US presidents have come and gone from the office in the time that Rahman has been leading Tajikistan, and that doesn't seem to be ready for change either, with the latest elections in October guaranteeing his position in the country until 2027, extending his reign out to 34 years as the president of Tajikistan. So who is Emomali Rahman? the Tajik strongman who has managed the direction of the country for nearly three decades. And how stable is the ground he stands upon? Well, for that, we turn to our second guest. Part 2. 92%. So Tajikistan is a former Soviet Central Asian Republic where they speak a Persian language like Iranian, uh, the language Tajik, um, it came out of the Soviet Union in 1991 as the Soviet Union entered and almost immediately went into a civil war, which was very complicated, involving different regional factions over control of the state and control of the economy. And it gradually came out of that in the late 1990s and over time has established a pretty authoritarian government under Imam Ali Rahman, who was a guy who rose to the fore during the civil war, was really placed there by warlords. Those warlords died off and receded, and he's now in charge. John Heathershaw is a professor of international relations at the University of Exeter, specializing in Central Asia. He was also the co-author of the amazing book, Dictators Without Borders, specializing in the dictatorships in Central Asia, and has written two other books about post-conflict Tajikistan. He joins us today. So he was um, the head of a collective farm during the Soviet period and began to rise into slightly more senior administrative positions at the end of the Soviet Union when Tajikistan became an independent republic. Most importantly, he's from the region of Kulyob and particularly the district of Dangara. And that was where a great number of the powerful fighting forces that rose to the fore um, in the civil war, in the early part of the civil war, they were from there too. So Rahman was their kind of civilian administrator in a way. They wanted someone who would be loyal to them and they put him in a position where he could take over as the kind of secretary of the Republic it was initially. But actually a couple of those warlords fought amongst themselves. They both died. Um, so within a year, Rahman was in a position which was relatively unchallenged, but the war was still going on. Um, so he showed himself to be gifted administratively, I think, in the sense that, in the sort of sense, in the sort of post-Soviet sense, where administration is about playing off different factions against one another and uh, emerging on top. And, um, you know, he, he, he achieved his position that way. And eventually, I think he he realized that some kind of negotiated settlement was necessary under pressure from uh, Russia, Iran, Western states, the UN. And so he did a deal <coughs> with his opposite number in the opposition, a man called Said Abdullah Nori, and he 
He, in that way, they achieved a peace agreement with some relatively minor concessions to the opposition. Uh, but ultimately, Rahman stayed on top. And over time, he has been effective at pushing out all these opponents and, and now rules supreme. He's also got a really large family, um, sons and daughters, in-laws, uh, and many of them are very good at getting a share of the pie as well. So um, just a big family network and a network of insiders that really run the country. So his style of leadership, is it more aggressive like a Kim Jong-un of North Korea getting his hands dirty himself? Or is it more running and having control of the administration of a police state, much like Lukashenko in Belarus? Yeah, I mean, I think it's easier to think of him as part of a ruling clique, a ruling class. You know, he doesn't do the banging of heads together. It's not him who does the dirty work. But he's certainly over recent years shown himself to be very willing to order the kinds of very brutal and direct actions against his enemies. And also, obviously, during the later stages of the Civil War, we don't know as much about that period, but there was a lot going on of that kind. So, you know, there's a lot of violence in Tajik politics, and he's never been directly implicated in that, but he has people who do it for him. And I think we'd be naive to think that, you know, he wasn't in some way uh, commanding and ordering some of that violence to take place. And I'm talking about things like uh, torturing peaceful oppositionists who have been detained and also probable assassination attempts against opposition figures overseas. And that's just the stuff that we know about or we can infer in recent years. So Rahman was not his original name. By birth, he was Rahmanov. So why would he go through all of the trouble of dropping the OV off the back of his name? Well, um, you know, Central Asian states, all of them are nationalizing states. They are seeking to establish themselves as independent nations. And, and nationalism is their leitmotif. You know, it's what they what gives them legitimacy and a rationale. Uh, they all have, you know, an extensive history of settlements and um, ethnic culture and things like this. But as modern states, they're very, very new. And, you know, the, the notion that there is any uh, there is a long history of a Tajik state in the territories which the, cur the current sta Tajik state governs it, it is just a myth. So in that context, it's really important to generate a myth, indeed, of this great national republic. Um, part of the way the Tajiks do that is by claiming certain... Persian heritage and great Persian cities and culture as their own, as Tajik, as part of Tajik history. And the move from, from Rachmanov, the Russified version of his name, um, which, you know, most Tajiks still have these Russified versions of their name, which they were born with and which, you know, were acquired in, in the Soviet Union. He moved away from that in, I think it's 2006, 2007, to Rahman, which is a kind of Persian version of his name. Some other members of the elite followed suit, but not all. Um, and yeah, that was a kind of form of signaling, I think, to say, to, to indicate Tajikistan's independence and its long history of statehood, as they would see it. In reality, that, that history of statehood is very short. So Tajikistan on paper is a democracy, and Rahman wins these elections by frankly huge numbers. 98% in 1999, 79% in 2006, 83% in 2013, and now most recently, he won 92% of the vote in October. How is he pulling these sorts of numbers? Is he genuinely popular, or is there some electioneering going on behind the scenes here? Yeah, I think it's a combination of things. Um, I think the first thing to bear in mind is that there's only really been one properly competitive election in Tajikistan, and that was the presidential elections in 1991 which are remembered in Tajikistan as precipitating the civil war. So where you have genuine competition over political power, the result there is always bad news from a certain perspective. So in many ways, people don't value political competition. Elections are always causes of fear and some worry. So a competitive election is bad news. In that sense, how do you bring about a non-competitive election? Well, you do things like you prevent serious opposition figures from taking part, not necessarily because they would be super popular, because 
most of them don't really have much in the way of national profile. But they would say things which disrupted the kind of stability that the government wants to convey. So you cut them out, but then you maintain a semblance of competition by having a few loyalists uh, who give this sort of appearance of competition. So you have four or five candidates from parties like the Agrarian Party or the Party of Economic Reform or the Communist Party. And, and they stand up and they, they've got no real national profile. No one knows who they are, but they give this sort of sense of a campaign. And you've really only got one candidate left standing of any note, and that's the president himself. And, um, and then obviously the vast majority of people who do vote are asked to vote where local village elders and leaders will kind of press people out to vote. We've got to vote, you know, it's an election and they'll come out and they will sign for Imam Ali al-Rahman. And then I think well, we can think finally then about the voter and when they're making that choice, are they doing it just because they're coerced, because they're told to, um, or because they, you know, they, they sincerely uh, support President Rahman? In a way, I think that's a sort of secondary question. The primary question is, do they think they really have any choice? Do they think it will make any difference? Do they really believe in the power of making a choice uh, to provide accountability to the government? And the answer to those questions is no. So in a sense, it's kind of incidental then who you vote for. I think people do give a good amount of recognition and credit to President Rahman for ending the war and achieving stability. But over time, that seems to to be dissipating. Most people are just really cynical about politics. Uh, many people still suffer from a great deal of poverty. The only way that they can really subsist, the only reason they can make ends meet is because some members of their family are migrating to Russia or other places and then sending money home. So they know this government hasn't brought them prosperity and they also know the stability is pretty tenuous. So it's a vote, I guess, out of fear out of a lack of a sense of choice and because there really is no alternative. Rahman is often regarded as one of the richest men in Central Asia, yet the official salary of the president of Tajikistan is a pretty measly 13,000 US dollars a year. So is he one of the thriftiest savers of all time or is there some corruption going on here? Now, um, we know he has other streams of income. I mean, we see tips of the iceberg and clues. So it's it's very hard to say, you know, for certain. But um, yeah, there's plenty of evidence of members of the Tajik elite, including the Rahman family, having access to many, many millions. Uh, so I guess what we know most about is, and this is what I've written about, is the aluminium company, which is um, which is state owned and which is used as a kind of cash cow really by the regime. And the way they do that is, is and this is how we know about it really, they do that through uh, what's called a tolling arrangement where the profits and the cash is really being accrued overseas, even though the business is being conducted in Tajikistan legally, the entity which has the money are offshore companies in the British Virgin Islands. And those funds we know because of court cases and some leaks, are used for all sorts of things. You know, they use for to pay for shopping trips for uh, the president's wife. They use to help uh, one of the daughters lease planes for an airline. Uh, we they know they use to lobby um, on behalf of the country. So it's it's a mix of public and private uh, purposes that money like that is used for. And obviously, within the country, he has access to to all kinds of riches above and beyond what that kind of salary would allow him. And that's just because of his sovereignty and his position as, as the head of state. So, you know, the political and economic power he has is far greater than anything indicated by his, his, um, his official salary. And, and the point is that those two things are fused. You know, it, it, Tajikistan is a properly, what we might call patronal system. It's run by a patron. And that person fuses power in business and power in government. If you want to do well in business, you need approval um, from the regime and they take their cut. The aluminium company you're referring to here is Talco, the state aluminium corporation. How important is Talco to the overall GDP of Tajikistan? It certainly was the main thing. Um, 
you know, I think it 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 helped raise an estimated forty percent of foreign currency reserves from the one aluminium smelter um, at one stage, certainly ten or twelve years back. So it was it was a very big thing coming out of civil war when it was the really the only serious industry in the country that was functioning, hugely important. Now it's less important relatively because. You've seen quite a lot of investment, particularly Chinese investment into other sectors like coal mines, mineral deposits, um, industries like cement, um, and, you know, and, and then exporting those things to Chinese markets. So that level of investment has meant there's been diversity there. And also the big sort of new economic quest for the Tajiks is exporting electricity, um, particularly to the south, actually. And... Um, doing that through the generation of hydroelectric power through the Rogan Dam, which is supposed to be the highest in the world. It's, it's not been completed yet, but I think they have two turbines in there now and it generates relatively large amounts of electricity. But what you actually have is that electric being exported or being slated either for export or for use in talco, because aluminium production, of course, is, is highly reliant upon large amounts of electricity whilst you still have and i know this is true this week in tajikistan very long electricity outages for domestic consumers so you know you're entering winter it's starting starting to get really cold and yet you may only get electricity for 10 12 hours a day um and you know you you, you get long outages so rahman is starting to get up there age-wise and before the 2020 election, he managed to get changes through the constitution that would allow his eldest son, the current mayor of Dushanbe, to run for president. It was widely speculated he was going to hand over the reins to his son before the 2020 elections, but instead he chose to run himself and he won the election. Why do you think Rahman changed his mind and didn't hand over to his son? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a question which invites lots of speculation, really, because we, you know, the, the thing you you need to know about most is the thing that's hardest to get information on, which is the kind of palace politics. Um, so, you know, why isn't the sun rising yet? Yeah, absolutely. It was set up the possibility of doing that. I mean, I think the first thing to say is that dynastic succession is actually really rare. You don't get it in much of the world. And in Central Asia, there's been lots of cases where it looked like it might happen. Um, like the Karim of the girls and the uh, Dariga Nazabayeva uh, in Kazakhstan, but it, it's it's not happened. And, you know, I think there are a few reasons for that. Um, and one is that there's no hiding what's going on. You know, it's clear who the person is who's being set up. And I think that means other rivals who might think they could take the throne when uh, the, the chief steps down know who their opponent is. And they maybe have find subtle ways to undermine that person. Um and they can they can mobilize to favor another candidate, um, like someone you know, like a Tokayev maybe or a Mizoyoyev in, Uzbe- in Uzbekistan who who succeeded those two leaders instead of the children. So you could have some of that in Tajikistan. I think it's pretty hard to say who that would be at the moment. Um, most of the prominent figures are family members, children, and in-laws. But I think there's a particular issue here with, with Rustam Ali, where the son, the older son, where he is known to be impetuous. Uh, he has a temper. He's known for some very dodgy incidences with women, for driving his car recklessly in the city. Um, and perhaps he's just someone who doesn't have the capacity of his father for leadership and, and decision making. And obviously, you know, this is a very high stakes thing. If the wrong person comes in, if that person steps in with brutality, um, then things could go very, very badly wrong. And I guess it's possible that Rahman's thinking about that himself. You know, is this a chalice that he really wants to pass on to to the son? Maybe better let, let him, you know, keep a, a second order role, protect his wealth but not be the person who is the target of all others and the person who's ultimately responsible. When you take a look into the fragile economy of Tajikistan, the majority of the money comes from two sources. Remittances coming back from Russia, 
and the black market. Tajikistan is the entry path from Afghanistan and Pakistan into Central Asia and then on to Russia and the rest of Europe. Everything from people smuggling, heroin, guns and terrorism is smuggled across the incredibly porous southern border with Afghanistan. But now China, Russia and the EU are trying to do whatever they can to stop the crossings here in Tajikistan before they reach home for them. But how well is that going? And can such a developed drug route actually be stopped? Well for that, we turn to our third guest. Part 3. A Smuggler's Paradise In 2015, the government uh, banned and labelled the leading opposition party, the Islamic Renaissance Party of Tajikistan, uh, a terrorist organisation. And since then, has sort of been uh, cracking down on all sort of forms of opposition, human rights lawyers, journalists, um, and you know individuals who are criticising the government. So compared to Uzbekistan, it is more authoritarian. It's certainly more authoritarian than Kyrgyzstan. It's obviously the region's most sort of... Uh, democratic, semi-democratic country, with a much more open political system. So Tajikistan's political system is very closed. Edward Lemon is a research assistant professor at Texas A&M University. He is also the president of the Oxus Society, a non-profit organization dedicated to fostering academic exchange in Central Asia. Edward is also a former fellow at the Harmonist Society, which focuses heavily on the Central Asian region and the politics of each of those nations. He joins us today. Sort of authoritarian regimes rely on three pillars, um, as sort of political scientists call them. You know, so I think the first is repression, which is the most obvious sort of form or feature of an authoritarian regime. So the government has very powerful security services um, that you know have a sort of surveillance network um, and you know monitor uh, criticism of the government within the media, within the academy, with academics. Um, within the social media, you know, and individuals who view certain videos, um, individuals who write things that are critical of the government are likely to receive a visit from um, or a call from the security services. Um, even individuals who've left the country, often pressure is placed upon them through their relatives back home, who often come under pressure for the activities of their um, relative who's living abroad. So I think repression is one of the major methods. And, you know, as part of this crackdown on opposition, we've seen hundreds of individuals detained on politically motivated charges. When Tajikistan is brought up in international conferences, it is almost always through the lens of the country being a risk for exporting Islamic terrorism. How credible do you think those allegations are? Well, I think, you know, the as, as you said, sort of counter-extremism and counter-terrorism in Tajikistan is less about fighting an actual terrorist threat and more about consolidating political power. Of course, a, a terrorist threat exists. Um, Tajikistan sent the largest per capita number of foreign fighters to Syria and Iraq, around 1,800 if we're to believe government estimates, and they seem to be relatively accurate. Um, even more when we factor in the individuals from the Turkish government statistics that tried to go to Syria and Iraq and were blocked at the border. Um, that, that number swells to, I think, around 4,000 individuals at that point. So, you know, relatively high. And I think if we're comparing it to other countries um, per capita terms, I think it's third, will be third highest in the world after Tunisia and the Maldives. When it comes to actors like Islamic State, Tajikistan is sending lots of fighters. But is that relationship reciprocal? Are organizations like IS sending money and support back to Tajikistan to help in their struggle to overthrow Rahman, who has cracked down on Muslim extremism for years, even banning under-18s from entering mosques for a while there? Is IS sending support back to Tajikistan, or is this simply just a one-way street? Um, well, I think, you know, the obviously Islamic State formed a group called... Uh, Islamic State of Khorasan Province back in 2015, um, 2014, 2015. Um, and that's a group that's based out of Afghanistan and has a more sort of, you know, Central Asian focus and sort of has stated its desire, unlike the Taliban, to move north of the river into post-Soviet Central Asia from Afghanistan, um, but obviously has had limited success. I mean, I think, you know, this, this sort of move by the Islamic State to encourage its supporters to lead attacks wherever they are, you know, which has been their policy you know, since 2015, 2016, um, has, you know, led to certain attacks like the one that we saw in 2018 in, uh, in Tajikistan. These were individuals who were seemingly mobilized in Russia through someone who'd um, spent time in Syria, um, a recruiter there, and then returned to Tajikistan just weeks before leading the attack. So they were sort of sent there 
uh, recruited by Islamic State and sort of encouraged to go back to Tajikistan to be attacked. A lot of the funding for these organizations comes from the illegal smuggling routes coming out of Afghanistan. What sort of items are being smuggled across the border here? You know, there's a number of things crossing that border. Um, drugs is the most significant. You know, I think the UNODC estimates that are now a decade old, and unfortunately there are, there are no more recent figures, as far as I'm aware, you know, estimate that you know, the, about 30% of the economy uh, comes from, from the drug trade, um, something like 100 tonnes of heroin, um, opium, transiting through the country each year, mostly uh, destined for the Russian market. Um, so that's a very significant part of the economy. Um, most of it's crossing uh, via formal borders. So, you know, to be a border guard or to be a, a border officer in, in Tajikistan is it's something you pay a lot of money to be, or you're in networks where you're, it, it's certainly a significant reward. And so most of this trade is not happening by small scale drug peddlers putting boats across the river between the two countries. Most of it's going across the bridges, the very bridges that were built by donors such as uh, the United States um, and the Aga Khan Foundation. Um, so it's very much, you know, part of the it's part of the informal economy, but it's also controlled by um, organized criminal groups and the state itself. Um, so we have this sort of state crime nexus. Um, other things crossing that border include, I think, tobacco, um, uh, precious stones, um, other some other marijuana, I think, to some degree. Um, but mostly, I think, heroin and opium is by far, in terms of value, is by far the most valuable commodity going across that border. And what is the final destination for the majority of this heroin? I know a lot of it heads to Russia, but is it mostly consumed by the Russian bloc or does it continue on to the rest of Europe? As far as I'm aware, most of it, you know, ends up in Russia. Um, there are obviously a number of other routes uh, that the drug trade from Afghanistan takes with a, with a more significant, such as the Iranian route. Um, but as far as I'm aware, that's sort of the source of much of the heroin in, in Europe. Um, but, you know, I'm sure some of the heroin transiting through, through Central Asia does end up in, in, in the European market as well. Why do the smugglers choose to go through Tajikistan? Why not Uzbekistan or Iran? I think, you know, Tajikistan's border with Afghanistan is relatively lengthy. Uh, the longest border in, between a post-Soviet Central Asian state and Afghanistan. Uzbekistan's border is very short. They have a border fence um, that, you know, and they have one formal border crossing. Um, and so, you know, there are fewer opportunities there. Turkmenistan's border is is also sort of not that well defended, but there's less drug, there are fewer drugs going through Turkmenistan, most likely because of the governments uh, being more opposed to that. Um, whereas in Tajikistan, you know, I think there's been this um, ongoing trade that emerged out of the sort of, out of the, um, out of the civil war. So I think you know, I think the, the Tajikistan's border is is the easiest logistically um, to send drugs through with regards to Central Asia. China, Russia, and the EU have all put large amounts of money and men into trying to help patrol that border to stop the drugs coming in. But have any of these attempts actually been successful? When we look at the official seizures, you know, um, we haven't seen we've seen them sort of fluctuate and. Tajikistan with donor help set up a drug control agency just over, over a decade ago now. And that was really tasked with, you know, uh, fighting, fighting the drug trade, obviously. And, you know, they would obviously capture a symbolic number of drugs, um, a couple of tons each year. But, you know, what we're, we haven't seen sort of a rapid increase um, in the number of drugs being seized. We're still seeing somewhere in the 2 to 3%, maybe 4% of drugs being uh, seized each year. So, you know, for me, that's sort of just symbolic. It's deferring and, and sort of sim signaling to the donors that they're doing something. But obviously, the vast majority of the drugs are still flowing through. You know, as you say, the EU has put millions, hundreds of millions of dollars into this problem through a program called Bomka. Russia, Russian border patrols used to patrol the border till 2004. They still have border advisors, a very large military facility uh, in the country, the largest military base, Russian military base outside of Syria. Um, and China, as you say, has recently established its own um, overseas military facility in the country and from the reports sort of is participating in joint border patrols and has been renovating border posts. Um, so certainly there are a lot of actors involved, um, a lot of actors, external actors who have an interest in 
stabilizing Afghanistan and making sure that unrest doesn't spill over the border. But none of them have been able to curb the drug trade. Um, you know, in the case of the Russian border guards, when they were posted there because they were also on the take, I think you can say, um, and from the others because, you know, there's so many incentives for what the Tajik government and state to um, maintain the drug trade, given it's such a source of income for them. So I think there's really a, there's, there's a lack of will on the Tajik government side, we can say, and a lack of capacity on the side of uh, external donors in particular to, you know, completely curb this trade. A number of prominent Russian experts often state a worry that if Tajikistan were to destabilize and break down into chaos, that that would likely echo throughout the region. Uh, do you think that's true, that a destabilized Tajikistan would cause problems for its Central Asian neighbors? My view has been that it's very difficult to make predictions. Um, but thus far, I think the great sort of surprise of the region um, has been how remarkably stable the entire region has been. I'm skeptical um, as to whether it can see a mass destabilization. You know, the population is just so resilient right there now putting up with the coronavirus, the COVID pandemic, which is having a, you know, a very negative effect on the economy, leading to you know, remittances falling by one third. Remittances from labor migrants make up something like a third of the economy. Um, so we're going to see you know, a lot of what we are seeing, a lot of economic problems in the country's issue with food security, um, dwindling household revenues. And, you know, what we're not seeing is any sort of sense of unrest or, or sense of resistance to the government. It's still, you know, remaining relatively stable. So my view is that the population remains very resilient. Many people will put up with the system as it is, even knowing that it could be better, but knowing ultimately it could be a lot worse with the sort of memories of the civil war. If any of these nations want any hope of fighting the drug trade, or containing the problems coming out of Afghanistan, these countries need to become very invested in the future of Tajikistan. These nations' doctrines rely on the theory that they would rather fight the drug war in the south of Tajikistan than fight it on the streets of Moscow or Beijing. China in particular cannot afford the instability in the western provinces, the ones that share borders with the wild frontiers of Tajikistan. Beijing already has many bases and facilities in Tajikistan, but unlike its bases in Myanmar or Djibouti, China is unwilling to publicly claim them. But why? What is China trying to achieve in this rugged mountain land? We'll find that out. We turn to our final guest. Part 4. Old Lifelines, New Masters Right, so I would describe Tajikistan as one of the most vibrant and fair democracy. No, I'm just kidding. It's one of the worst mafia states um, remaining in the world, whose entire economy depends basically on facilitating drug trade and drug flows from Afghanistan, um, whose job it has been for the ruling um, elite to systematically clamp down and um, surgically destroy any germs of opposition or free thinking or um, democracy or anything positive you can imagine coming there from uh, for the past 27 years since um, Rahman has been in power. So it's, uh, you know, it's a system that is, um, that is holding itself together really well. Matthew Bolenge is a research fellow for the Russia and Eurasia program at Chatham House as well as an analyst for the Center for Analysis of Foreign Policy in Paris. Matthew is an expert in post-Soviet and Eurasian defense and security, and he joins us today. But it's also a very fragmented and divided country, because since the, since the end of the Civil War, um, and now the end of this power-sharing agreement that took place after the end of the Civil War, um, the country has been increasingly fragmented in terms not only of geography, because of the different um, constituent parts of Tajikistan, but also in terms of access for people. Uh, economic insecurity and health insecurity has been growing consistently, and COVID, uh, the COVID pandemic has also shown the limits of this system in terms of access to healthcare, in terms of access to um, e economic uh, subsidies for the population. 
And there is still a large inequality of access uh, for, for most of the population. And finally, it is a very divided country when it comes to its own borders, with a lot of violence, a lot of insurgency, and a lot of issues concerning uh, border management, drug trade, water issues, and stability across the borders, but also with external balances like Russia, China, and the United States, and the European Union, uh, among other powers. So overall, um, yeah, a, a very pleasant country to be a tourist uh, in, but definitely not to live in at the moment, especially if you're on the wrong side of the equation. One of the rockiest relationships in Central Asia is that between Tajikistan and Uzbekistan. Why is there such animosity and distrust between these two nations? So as I, um, as I explained, it's mostly linked to you know all of the above in the sense that there is still a lot of... Um, a lot of insecurity across the border concerning the drug trade, concerning insurgent elements, and the fact that most of the insurgency, uh, well, most, a, a part of the in, insurgency uh, come stemming from Uzbekistan in the, in, the, uh, in the late 90s, notably the IMU, um, moved to Tajikistan after 98, when they were kicked out of the country, and when it became too, uh, too complicated to operate for them in Uzbekistan, they moved to Tajikistan and uh, found refuge in these sort of insurgent valleys uh, south of the Fergana Valley in, uh, in Tajikistan, um, in, in Rasht and Tabaldara, for instance. So that they fed political resentment from Tajikistan, that insecurity in the country was indeed coming from Uzbekistan. So it sort of soured political relations. Um, and also because there's, there's been a competition, for instance, when the, um, when the coalition the, um, the, the US-led international coalition uh, to Afghanistan moved into Central Asia and for the first time in a way uh, since the, the 90s uh, took sort of notice of the region as a whole, there was competition for access to US money um, and international donor assistance between these countries and Tajikistan and Uzbekistan were trying to sort of wow international donors and actors into, um, into the country or to trick them inside. Uh, which led to further resentment between both countries. What I would argue is that there is definitely um, a very tense and complicated bilateral uh, relationship between um, between Tashkent and Dushanbe. The problem is that these issues are amplified because nobody really wants to sit down and discuss the, the key issues, which is, as you mentioned, it's uh, water issues in Central Asia because Tajikistan is an upstream country and controls a lot of the water going and flowing downwards towards Uzbekistan, for instance. Um, and a lot of the water is controlled directly through two main rivers, the Pyanj and the Vakhsh. And, and Tajikistan has the ability to basically, yes, cut the, um, cut, uh, the, uh, the supply of water and specifically cut the supply of uh, hydroelectric production uh, from their facilities upstream uh, and suspend power to Uzbekistan regularly and also Afghanistan because Uzbekistan has been a major, uh, Tajikistan, sorry, has been a major provider of electricity and hydroelectric power for Afghanistan as well. Um, and they are playing it almost as a political hand, if you will. So beyond good neighborly management with Uzbekistan and Afghanistan, they are definitely using it for, for power politics and political uh, political purposes. And if you add uh, more, you know, uh, grievance to injury and with the, these cultural spats and these cultural um, resentment between um, the, the, the Silk Road capital cities and who belongs to whom, then you're, you're, you're feeding in the sense of, um, of, of bad relations between both countries. So when uh, the new president of uh, Uzbekistan, uh, Mirzi Yoyev, came to power, uh, a few years ago, uh, there was an attempt to try to pacify relations with, uh, with Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan. For, uh, as a whole, it did manage to improve bilateral relations uh, after 2016 with Kyrgyzstan, and he moved in to try to, uh, t t to discuss border delineation and, and, and to address uh, border issues with Kyrgyzstan. He did the same with Tajikistan, but the uh, sort of mistrust remains. Uh, not least because the, the, the power in place in Tajikistan has been so hardened around describing Uzbeks and, and, and the leadership in Uzbekistan as potential enemies and unfriendly people that it's really hard to build this trust from the Mirza Yoyev government after he, um, he moved into power in 2016. And also because this, this sort of open um, 
open moment for Mirza Yoyev with his opening to the world and to Central Asia in particular only lasted a few months, if not a year, and then he moved back to business as usual in the sense of consolidating his own power and um, basically yes, coming back to the rules of the game instead of trying to become a more uh, inclusive and open and diverse country that we expected from the Mirza Yoyev presidency. So overall, this, this is adding sort of a brick uh, wall of mistrust and discomfort when dealing with bilateral relations between Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. With Tajikistan being a Sunni Muslim majority nation, what is their relationship like with the Gulf states of Saudi Arabia and the UAE? T- Tajikistan is, 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 is 95% Sunni. Uh, so it's quite a homogenous, um, homogenous country when it comes to the, the religious mix in a way, um, and it's 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 if you want it's a sort of traditional uh, rural local you know local beliefs based traditional and pacified Islam that is practiced as a mix of there's a lot of mix with former um, beliefs from the region uh, stemming from way back when. Um, so it's it's you know a mix of Zoroastrianism, fire cults, for instance, or specific uh, cults in the Pamir Mountains that that were blended together uh, with Islam, that that form a sort of you know local local Islam that is that is uh, more like a practice for every day than something they can brandish as a potential flag for nationalism or something like this. So Saudi Arabia or countries from the Gulf would find probably less grasp and less things to to grip uh, in terms of financing uh, places of cult than in other countries of the region. Um, And also because the Rahman government has been excessively uh, strong and ruthless in clamping down in sort of um, non-systemic Islam, as they would call it, because of the civil war and because the civil war was generally described as a sort of Post-Soviet Reds versus the Islamists, which is a very, uh, very easy, uh, very easy summary of what the civil war was. Um, so, so in a way, the uh, the, the Tajik government and the Rahman powers, more specifically, um, have always been clamping down on any sort of discontent from the from the more active. Uh, Islamic community in Tajikistan and they've been conducting these campaigns where they basically they, they were even well it's not jokes because it's tragic but they were they, they were doing these sort of uh, cutting the beard of traditional religious leaders campaigns whereby they would go to more villages and if they, they, they saw someone in a traditional garment for instance or showing external signs of belonging to uh, to a cult, they would basically cut their beards or things like this, which um, could, could seem, you know, like a joke, but it's it's tragic when you think about it. But this is the sort of um, government repression that you have for these people. Uh, so, you know, there is the state Islam that is a, a very, you know, accepted form of cult, and everything that goes above the threshold is considered a direct national security threats and must be treated very harshly, which is also feeding insecurity for the more active uh, parts of the community and therefore feeding more resentment and therefore feeding more radicalism. So it's an endless circle um, of resentment, but it's something that is really close to responses we've seen, for instance, in Uzbekistan or Kyrgyzstan. We haven't yet mentioned the United States in this piece, but in the early days of the Afghan war, the US used to use Tajikistan for refueling, logistics and transport for their campaign into Afghanistan. Is that relationship still there between Dushanbe and Washington, or is it somewhat waned? So, yeah, it's it, it's sort of a true, or, well, sort of true to say that in, in, in 20, um, after, after 9-11, uh, when uh, the coalition was formed to, um, to, to invade Afghanistan, um, the, the U.S. security establishment sort of discovered Central Asia on the map, right? It's 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 a bit of a, an overstatement, but there was an influx of interest towards Central Asia, which was a region that was little known to the uh, American body politic, and even less so for international donors or military experts. So, in a way, there was a huge influx of means, of infrastructure, of interest for the region trying to understand how to leverage American interests in the region, specifically um, in Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan. Tajikistan was less concerned because the US presence was always uh, uh, less than Kyrgyzstan, for instance. Um, But there definitely was a lot done uh, 
in terms of infrastructure, soft conditionality for loans and assistance and development grants and so on, equally from the US and the, uh, the European Union, by the way. So it was the golden age for Tajikistan to sort of leech onto these US, uh, US, uh, US aid, for instance, projects or these military consultancy projects and so on that would have very, very soft conditionality and would be sort of disregarding of issues concerning human rights and abuses and, and the rule of law in Tajikistan. So it was really a golden age. And then when, um, when the, the coalition disbanded and US withdrew from Afghanistan in 2014, then the... Um, the interest completely fell by the wayside and the uh, the maps that they had discovered after 9-11 were thrown away and pushed back to uh, to the, the bottom of the pile. And I would argue that the US lost complete interest in the region. And now nobody talks about Central Asia and the US and it's really not a fashionable thing to discuss Central Asia in the, uh, in, in the policy establishment in Washington. Um, plus the, the cost of operating became in a way too high. And playing by local rules, which is basically absence of rule of law, corruption, vested interest, and so on, became so high and visible that nobody wanted to operate there anymore, um, which created a sort of money and security void that uh, was filled by China, which is the next best thing for the region, and specifically for, uh, for, for, for Tajikistan in terms of security. Um, all of the above is equally true for the European Union. There, there was a massive um, um, interest uh, after 9-11 with, once again, soft conditionality, uh, a lot of discussions around um, sort of loans for uh, better governance in, in, in the region, uh, more specifically in Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan. Tajikistan was less concerned because they, um, they started from, uh, from lower in the food chain in a way. But um, the, the same, uh, unfortunately, the same logic applies that today Central Asia is no longer a priority if it ever were uh, in, in, in terms of... Um, of assistance and donor-based um, assistance from the EU as well. Depending on who you ask, somewhere between 35 and 50% of the Tajik economy comes from remittances from Tajiks who go off to work in Russia and send money home. Obviously being so reliant on Russia in a way that Moscow could close that option at any moment must have a huge impact on the relationship between Dushanbe and Moscow. So yeah, that's the uh, that, that that's one of the main issues for the, for for Russia, and I think that's a good place to start describing this relationship today. Is that Russia is no longer the sole guarantor of security and the sole balance provider for 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 Central Asia in general and for Tajikistan in particular um, at the moment, uh, because Russia is losing ground and losing way in terms of heritage, in terms of post-Soviet sort of decolonization to the region, and is losing ground specifically to China these days, and losing ground to the whole region, sort of appropriating its own future. Um, so when it comes to Russia, yes, the relationship is, is, is manifold in terms of dependencies and interdependencies coming from, uh, from Moscow, because as you said, remittances are still uh, the main provider, one of the main provider of uh, direct cash for the economy. So if you look at the, um, the composition of the GDP of Tajikistan, and if you, if you look at the fact that two-thirds of said GDP is, is unofficially drug trade, then the remaining third is, uh, is remittances. Uh, in 2019, they amounted, uh, these remittances coming from uh, migrant workers in Russia amounted to about a third, 30 plus percent of uh, the national GDP. So th this is a massive uh, element of stability for the country. It'll be more uh, unstable in 2020 because remittances have already decreased a lot, uh, at least by 15 percent for the first half of 2020 because of COVID and because of border closures in the region and because there is just less work for migrant workers in Russia because of the, the COVID pandemic, uh, which will be once again yet another problem to deal with in terms of economic stability uh, for the country in terms of debt management, in terms of uh, failing banking system and the, the Somoni, the, the currency being regularly devalued. Um, which could expect the country to go into GDP contraction in 2020 and, and increased prices for commodities and uh, goods of uh, first necessity for, uh, for, for people. So this, this is really not helping uh, with overall stabilization. So 
all in all, yes, Russia is this this key element when it comes to economic stability for the country. Um, if you look at Russia's uh, military presence, for instance, well, there's still a lot of troops. It's the largest presence of Russian troops outside um, in the region, in Central Asia. With the presence of three facilities, at least, uh, in Tajikistan as part of the, um, the, the Russian uh, 201 uh, motor rifle division. Uh, which are based here, and they, they are mostly used as sort of second layer of defense logic to protect the rest of the Russian territory from uh, insurgency in Afghanistan and uh, insecurity coming from the region, um, from the Fergana Valley to Afghanistan to across the Chinese border in Xinjiang. Um, so this sort of second border logic has been has been always the sort of buffer for Russia to keep a hard military presence, and now. Uh, in, uh, in Tajikistan, and also to keep tabs and potentially facilitate parts of the drug trade, which is not excluded because, you know, there's, uh, <laughs> there's no such thing as uh, corrupt money when it comes to these things. Well, the other huge regional player here is obviously China, who has a large military presence and major investments in Tajikistan. So what is the relationship like between Dushanbe and Beijing at the moment? So it's it's also a very complicated relationship. It's it's not as rosy as as one could um, could describe in the sense that um, yes, China in a way is, is is filling the voids and the vacuum that Russia and the United States have left open um, after 2014 for the U.S. and because of the Russian retrenchment from the region in general and the fact that they don't really own the uh, Central Asia's destiny anymore and they can't really keep it as a sort of congruent region that would be described you know the central asian republics is no longer a term that fits everybody because there's no one model there anymore it's not the 90s anymore and specifically to tajikistan which is something that we could have foreseen but in a way it was a gray rhino all along is the increased presence of military and security and defense uh, um, in the defense uh, sector of Tajikistan. Um, this started in the mid 2010s, and somewhere around 2016 or 2015, when the first agreements were signed between Tajikistan and China for the construction of uh, several, so they call, don't really call them bases, because that would be the step too far for Russia to accept. But China calls them these sort of border outposts or military outposts that are in charge of uh, controlling the border between uh, China, uh, sorry, between Tajikistan and Afghanistan specifically, um, and uh, different checkpoints along the Pyanj River uh, to monitor uh, to monitor the region. So five outposts across such a long distance is senseless in a way, but it is highly symbolic because it shows that Russia is losing ground to China in terms of direct military presence. So back in, the, back in the 90s, in a way, and after the end of the Soviet Union, there was a sort of implicit burden-sharing agreement right, between Russia and China, as one would, argue, would have argued. Russia kept things in the military and defense sphere in, in Central Asia, and China did the rest, which is basically economic stabilization and uh, governance, you name it, to try to keep things under control and keep things separated in terms of division of labor. Well, now it seems that this division of labor is dying slowly because China is increasing its footprint in the, uh, in the military sector, in Tajikistan more specifically. They're also trying to push for more things in Uzbekistan and uh, a lot in Kyrgyzstan as well. But Tajikistan is sort of the... Uh, the, the tip of this uh, this complicated spear or iceberg of a relationship. Um, they've been doing a lot of um, joint drills in the Pamir Mountains, for instance, for border control in the region. They've been doing some training for Tajik forces when it comes to uh, border management or drug, uh, drug control and policing and, and, and you name it. And there's been some assistance as well in uh, revamping the uh, military hardware for Tajikistan. So th th this is a step that for now is creating a lot of discomfort in Russia, as you can imagine, because of the burden sharing logic once again. It's sort of a, a knife in the back uh, that China is slowly planting. But it's also something that Russia can't really push back against, because the more they you know, call China's bluff that, yes, you are encroaching upon my... You know, my uh, my, my, my areas of sovereignty, the more China will, will, will increase its presence because they, they know that Russia can't do much.
about Chinese inroads because the power differential, especially in the economic, financial, infrastructure field, is so massive that Russia can't compete. So if, if a country like, like Tajikistan decides to sort of externally balance uh, towards China, then there's not so much Russia can do. And, and Beijing has very much understood this logic, that the level and amount of, push, of pushback from, from, from Russia is very limited. And something so, you know, so obvious as opening these border outposts, which are basically military bases, uh, was something that five years ago, ten years ago, would have been completely unthinkable in the region. So the more China makes inroads in the sector, the more, the more it shows you the Russian retrenchment from the region as well, which is really interesting. Um, and also because China has, has, has locked the country into a sort of debt trap as well. The uh, Tajikistan owes about $1 billion of debt, uh, mostly in infrastructure and economic sector uh, reform for Tajikistan. So this, this is also keeping the country you know, on, on its toes. And also because they've been ceding a lot of land, apparently, since the early 2010s, uh, and especially mining rights for uh, mining concessions to Chinese companies to sort of try to repay the loans and repay the debt. So it's sort of debt against participating share inside companies. So slowly but surely, they are trying to keep locking the country into submission. And there's only very little that Russia can do to, to do a better counteroffer um, which is leaving Tajikistan in a very complicated situation these days. Is there something Tajikistan could do to escape this slow-moving car crash, or are these problems simply just baked into the cake at this point? The problem with this country, a bit like Turkmenistan, is that they can still afford to, to, to live in a vacuum, um, despite the economic hardships and uh, you know, with remittances, for instance, despite the very, very complicated management of the economic structure and the failing economic system. The, the, the leadership can still um, work in a vacuum, keep the, uh, the sort of balance of power alive internally and externally, at least for the coming decade, and keep the population trapped in a sort of mental hostage situation with very little prospect for, for improvement of their life and their lifestyles. So as long as and there is also no solid ground for a political opposition or a color revolution or a Tajik spring or something that would spark uh, an upheaval, political upheaval in the region. So, in a way, as long as Rahman is in power, um, nothing will probably change, at least, you know, unless he dies in power, but transition is arranged to his son or his family. Um, it will depend on how, it, you know, how, how well it goes down with the population. But in a way, they can, they can still project a bit more uh, than the rest of the region, like Kyrgyzstan, for instance, which is trapped in political hardships, or, uh, or Kazakhstan, which is still trying to come to grasp with the power change recently. So, the, you know, the, there's not a lot that can be done to improve the situation in this country because there is, there is no solid ground for any sort of opposition or alternative thinking that, that would alter people's minds or change people's calculations concerning their, their own power. Uh, it, it might be necessary because they are not living in a, in, in a friendly country, but this is unfortunately what they have now. If I were to send someone to experience the edge of the world, I would send them to Tajikistan, where the government control does not extend far past the main highways and traditional values and practices from centuries ago still have their place in society today. Tajikistan is so uniquely isolated, being in the center of many major empires, but not being consistently marched through like Poland or Moldova. Being so mountainous and isolated meant that for most enemies, it was far easier to use diplomacy than force. So the Tajik culture developed on its own. But whilst being so isolated on a map, Tajikistan unfortunately functions at the mercy of many larger regional giants. The Tajik economy is so desperately dependent on Russian remittances and the Russian demand for illegal products like heroin. For the good of the country, you know they have to get rid of these. But in this region of the world, ways to secure much needed foreign currency are few and far between. So they continue with it and try to suck as much money from it as they possibly can in the time when it's possible. China at first, much like the story we've told many times before in the Central Asian region, seemed that they could be the new regional lifeline, the country to invest in Tajikistan and put them back on track. But these deals came with strings attached, and now Dushanbe has become reliant on the steady influx of money from Beijing, and we don't know yet what the end bill will come to. And even as the situation seems to continue to deteriorate, 
there isn't much the average citizen can even do about it. Rahman has been in power for over 26 years, and the only other option they have on the table seems to be his hothead son. Even looking outside the family to a new leader could be daunting for the average Tajik citizen, as the last time they dabbled in competitive politics, the country broke out into a horribly bloody civil war. So an attitude has begun to sweep the nation, of maybe it's better to stick with the devil they know. So what could ever change in Tajikistan? Will they ever be the center of a map? I don't think we can know that for sure. But history tells us that most of the time, big changes usually make their ways to the borderlands last. Thank you so much for tuning into the program. This is our last episode for 2020, and what a year it's been. We released 26 deep dives this year, ranging from private militaries to Nagorno-Karabakh to the drug trade in Thailand. We interviewed prime ministers, air force commanders, whistleblowers and experts from almost every continent of the globe. This is the first full year of the red line and it has been amazing. All the terrible things to come out in 2020, this show seemed to change that for me. And meeting all of you has been the highlight of my year. If you want to follow the show on social media, you can find us on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook on the handle at the red line pod. And if you want to follow me, you can find me on Twitter at Mike Elliott Oz. Oz is in Australia. We tackled some pretty huge stories this year and took the show from hundreds of listeners per episode to over a million streams this year. And that is completely thanks to our amazing Patreons who help keep this show going. Without them, there is no way we could possibly run this program. And if you want to join our amazing Patreons and hang out at our Q&As, you can join up for as little as a couple of dollars a month. Every dollar donated to the show goes right back into the program and helps us pay for the fees and costs of running a show like this, as well as giving us the ability to market and go after bigger and better stories each fortnight. I regularly catch up one-on-one -on -one with our Patreons both in the Q&As and also for individual Zoom calls. So if you want to catch up and have a beer over Zoom, you can just say Merry Christmas or Happy New Year, just sign up today and I'd love to meet you in person. A huge thanks to all the guests on the program this week. Pina Leddit is the go-to man for anything happening in Central Asia. You'd be hard-pressed to find anyone better connected or more knowledgeable about what is going on on the ground in the region, and it was fantastic to have him back on the program after his fantastic work on our piece on Turkmenistan. You can find him on Twitter on the handle at Peter underscore Leonard. John Heathershaw is the co-author of my favorite book about the region, Dictators Without Borders an excellent book that really gives you a good grasp on the inner workings of an incredibly complex collection of countries. John is the expert's expert when it comes to Tajikistan, and I can see why. If you want to follow more of John's fantastic work, you can find him on Twitter at HeathershawJ. Edward Lemon is one of the rising stars in this theatre, coming through some of the biggest think tanks to focus on the region. His work as the president of Oxus has been amazing, with Oxus already becoming a powerhouse in this sphere. It was great to finally get the chance to connect with Edward and work together on a piece. If you want to connect with Edward as well and follow some of his great work, you can find him on Twitter at EdwardLemon3. Matthew Bolenge continues the fantastic reputation of guests to come on this program from Chatham House, and I have wanted to get Matthew on the program now for a while, but we can never seem to make the timing work for previous episodes. So it was amazing to finally sit down with the man who had written so many of the papers I had read in research phases for various episodes. We will be very sure to have him back on the program sometime soon. As usual, I could not do this project without my amazing team. Mark Spencer does all the chapter titles and bumpers for the show, and has been with us for 25 episodes now. He's become such a huge part of the show, and I look forward to continuing to work with Mark for at least another 25 episodes to come, or as long as he'll put up with me. If you want to see some of the great work Mark does, you can find him on Twitter at Climactic Show, and I highly recommend you check it out. Joe also joined us this year and is becoming an invaluable part of the team, cleaning and helping prepare some of the audio for these episodes. He is a big part of how this show has reached the quality it has, and we are very grateful to have him on board. You can find Joe on Twitter on the handle at JoeHawthorne77. The last thanks goes out to you for listening to the program. What a year 2020 has been, with lockdowns, with elections, with wars, and with countless deaths. But no matter how isolating the lockdowns ever felt, I got to connect with you guys via Twitter or Facebook or Zoom, and I met so many of you this year. It really did make the difference to my lockdowns. With vaccines around the corner and the 2020 bar being so low, I would like to hope 2021 will be even better, both for the show and also for you listening. I look forward to the next year of doing this show, 
and meeting even more of you over the course of that year. The show will be back in a fortnight with another international episode, but until then, thank you and good night.